Welcome to this Killick Explains Finance video. This week, a short guide, stress short, to a big topic, financial statements for equity investors. Basically, we are, as I make this in early February, heading through quite a big season, potentially for corporate annual reports appearing. So what's in them? And if you're frankly intimidated by the sheer size of them, what bits can you take out as being the most useful in a reasonable space of time? Well, the background to this then is every year, companies by law have to produce annual financial statements. And boy, are these big documents, 100 pages or more, quite possible for a fully listed FTSE 100 company, for example. They're often drawn up to the 31st December or the 31st of March. Now, they don't have to be, but those are two quite common dates for companies. The end of the calendar year, basically, and the end of the tax year are quite popular. So the question is, given how big they are, only analysts tend to go through them with a really fine tooth comb, sort of cover to cover if you like, which bits could you pick out to help you reach a reasonably fast judgment on where the company's heading and how it's doing? So what do you get? Well, I've divided it into three sections. You get a massive document with a huge index page. You'll see one in a moment from Tesco. You get corporate reports. Now you get narrative, in other words. You get a story as told by the directors in fairness, so careful, because they want you to read what they want you to read, but you get narrative. Then you get hit with the numbers, the three primary statements, probably 40 to 50 pages in. So in a moment, I'll suggest which bits of that 40 to 50 pages you might want to read first. And then a lot of supporting notes. Supporting what? These three primary statements. And these supporting notes can go on for another 40 or 50 pages. Now, in theory, you should read the lot, but if you haven't got time or you haven't got the, the technical ability, where do you even start? Now, corporate reports. Watch out for the next slide, it looks pretty unpleasant. So this is Tesco, and you won't even be able to see the writing on here, there's so much jammed into the one page. But the point I'm trying to make is, you know, out of all of this lot, what would you pick out? I mean, would you read it all? And I'm gonna suggest there are a few bits here that are more interesting than others. If you could read them, there's an interesting bit there, there's an interesting bit there, if you like, and there's another bit just down here. Now, for anyone thinking, I can't even see what you've just circled, what are the three bits that I would start with? Personal preference, my opinion, where would I start? Well, I would say the financial review, not a bad place to start, usually prepared by the finance director. It's basically narrative, but it's normally reasonably focused compared to some of the other bits, and it does tell you a fair amount about the way the business has been performing and where it's got to in financial terms by the year end. Then, principal risks and uncertainties. Okay, it's a little bit boilerplate, it's a little bit one size fits all, but as an investor, really important to have a handle on what the principal risks facing the business might be. And when we get to the supporting notes, I'll show you a place to hunt down some evidence that this is giving you the full picture. Because that's part of the name of the game with accounts. Does the story match the numbers? And then the director's remuneration report. I don't need to sell that, I don't think too much. Let's take a look at what the directors are paying themselves, if you like. I mean, I know the shareholders have to approve it, but what do the directors think they're worth? Does that stack up with how you think the business is performing? So lots of other things you could read, and by all means, if you've got time, do so, but those are good places to start, in my view. Now, section two, the financial statements. I'm gonna keep this brief, and I'll give you a reference at the end to somewhere you can find a lot more information, but these are, halfway through or more, the profit and loss account the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. Now, some analysts and investors have a preference. They say cash is king. Number three matters more than number two. I disagree. I think they all play their part in telling you how the business has performed and where it's got to. The profit and loss account is financial performance over the last 12 months in revenue and cost terms. The balance sheet's like a snapshot of where the business has got to, what it's worth using accounting rules at the end of the year, 31st December, 31st of March, the cash flow statement tells the story, a bit like this one over here, but using different techniques, using cash in and cash out. Or, put it another way, if you've got two balance sheets prepared 12 months apart, there's this year's, the latest one, there's last year's, the profit and loss account and the cash flow statement. If these are like snapshots, if you like, at a particular point in time, What's the business worth in net asset terms? These are the stories that tell you how the business got there. And they tell a slightly different story and it's worth comparing and contrasting the two. Now, I'll get straight in with a reference for those people thinking, crikey, I haven't seen these before. If you want to understand a bit more about how profit and loss accounts, balance sheets and cash flows are put together, please do go to Killick 
www.thinkandgrowthinstitute.com forward slash learn and click on the financial statements tab over this side and that'll give you those videos. But let's move on. The supporting notes. So I said, we've got the corporate reports, the primary statements and the supporting notes. There are loads of these. You may have lost the world to live by now because you, you're already 40, 50 pages in and now there's another 40, 50 pages. So are there any bits that I would sort of shortcut to to get a feel for what's going on? Well, yes. The accounting policies. Now, this is a biggie. It's the first one you hit, by the way. This tells you what assumptions the directors have made in preparing the accounts. And I tend to look for changes, inconsistencies, things that don't smell right, if that makes sense. A little bit of experience helps, but accounting policies are important. And do they stack up with other firms in the same sector? How do they compare to industry norms? All that's important stuff. Then the hidden nasties towards the back of the notes section. Commitments and contingencies and changes in net debt. Stuff the directors might not want you to read first of all, that's why they tuck it away towards the back, but it's important in understanding how the business is performing and any hidden threats that might be out there. And finally, the five-year summary. After all, reading financial statements is about reading trends, so the snapshot you get from the primary statements needs to stack up over a longer time period. And that's not a bad place to start with the caveat that it has been prepared by the directors, so it'll probably tell the story they want you to read. The good news then, why am I doing all this work with financial statements? They're audited. So somebody says these are true and fair and prepared in accordance with the law, firms of accountants. They're prepared to a statutory format, which means that you can compare them apples for apples over different time periods. And that's quite important. The directors can't just prepare them any which way each year. And they do contain detailed commentary and numbers. And those two things are important in terms of understanding where the business has got to and what it might be worth in accounting terms. But they're out of date the moment you get them. So it takes months to prepare them as a shareholder. You'll be well past the 31st of March before you get your mitts on them, for example. They're prepared using accountants' rules. And if you don't understand the accounting rules, they can be a bit confusing. Why are brand names not always included in balance sheets, for example? So you have to be a little bit careful not to rely on them as a pure valuation tool. And audited doesn't mean guaranteed, as Carillion demonstrated. Auditors giving a professional opinion is not the same thing as someone guaranteeing what you're reading. So in conclusion, what do I say about these things? They are one of the best sources of information available in regards to a company's performance and position, but they're pretty intimidating. They're a mixture of facts and judgment, so be a little bit selective and keep an eye out in particular for changes, inconsistencies between the narrative and the numbers, for example, creativity in terms of the way the results have been presented, and evidence of any hidden nasties from whichever source. Those are some of the ways you can start to ask the question, do I believe the story being presented to me by the directors? Okay, lots of information there. So editor at killick.com with queries. And just to remind you of that tab link again, killick.com forward slash learn. Have a look down this side, financial statements tab.